step down. And here it is back with the white phosphor CRT and a bit of programming. Great picture. Fantastic sound. But we do have some interference. Becomes most visible when I turn the contrast all the way up. I know, Your Honor, there are no further witnesses. The defense rests. Very well. I'll back it Sorry, off and turn the brightness the down. At which time we'll hear the concluding remarks to the jury. And that's still pretty noticeable. Now I'd already gone and grounded the grid of the video and and that uh, interference does disappear. You'll be all right, son. So, well, one easy possibility is there is this metallic shield in the CRT, which should be grounded right now. It's not going to anything. Mr. Crawford, are you ready yeah. for your summation? It's crude, but yes, I can grab an alligator clip and simply short it out. No, no difference whatsoever. Could be a little bit of arcing down in the high voltage component somewhere. I tried to leave all the solder connections as smooth blobs with no sharp points, but I could apply some Corona dope to eliminate that possibility. Uh, pretty sure I got all the tube shields in place. There aren't many. One here, one here, and one here. Uh, it could be interference from the uh, equipment I've got. Um, could be coming from the converter box itself. So I could try some other signal sources. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't recall seeing this interference when I was using my test pattern generator. So it's curious. I don't think the set has... And power line filter. No. I couldn't try. I could try putting a safety cap across the AC line. Maybe I'm picking up some noise from the AC line. Uh, I could try turning off all the lights, including the fluorescent lights. See if that makes any difference. It's easy enough to do. Well, I turned off the lights, my computer, all the equipment, everything I could think of, and it really didn't make any difference. All right, I think it's long past time to take a look inside this high voltage box. Now, what I found most curious is that every single screw is in place, and they all appear to be original. I don't think I've ever seen that before. There's always screws missing, and the screws that are there are often mismatched, but this had every screw, which could potentially mean it's never been opened since the day the set was made. However, nope, it has. How do I know? Well, it's not a Motorola branded tube, but it's also not the old style of 1B3 rectifier, which would be quite a bit taller. And I can also see there's a 1B3 and 1G3, meaning it's a valid sub for both types. Again, an indicator that it's a later to the original would just say 1B3, and it would be about three quarters, maybe an entire inch taller. Alright, so it's been replaced. Now I can get in here and clean it up a little bit. Uh, and I'll maybe replace that with the taller tube. Now, uh, those of you who've never seen one of these before, maybe wondering what I'm going to be looking at. Well, this set doesn't use a flyback like a conventional magnetically deflected TV. This is um, uh, an RF type high voltage generator, so nothing to do with driving a yoke or any of that. 25L6 driving primary, which is a larger gauge wire down here, 
and pick off feedback from the high voltage rectifier to keep the oscillations going and this is a secondary to stacked windings of very fine wire sort of like a little Tesla coil sort of and there's a mic cap in here to keep things going as well and so all this does this generates uh, high DC voltage around five and a half six thousand volts somewhere in that back ballpark so back to this this is a like a tickler coil. This feeds back some energy back into the thing to keep the oscillations going. And positioning this is important. You want to get it in the sweet spot so you get maximum efficiency and maximum high voltage output. There's a number of ways you could do it. Uh, ideally, you got yourself a high voltage probe and you can just measure the DC output and adjust that. You can also look at the glow. It's not easy to see, but there's a filament up inside there. It's easier to see with the taller version. And you can adjust this such that the filament is glowing the brightest. Because the filament for this is derived from this loop. This uh, large insulated wire here is a couple turns wrapped around there. And that provides filament uh, power for this. So it's, it's, it's a... Uh, interesting design that it's all self-contained with these two tubes and this coil that uh, with all the feedback and whatnot going it also even provides the power for this tube for this tube's filament uh, and then the whole thing is inside this box to well shield it because well it's generating all kinds of uh, RF noise and also to keep prying fingers away from the dangerous high voltage something else I noticed maybe I noted this before I, I don't remember when I first looked at this but I noted it again if I did notice it before is that on the switch up here this is the modification where somebody cut this put in a BNC jack and a switch which really isn't wired to anything TV and ham so whatever somebody was intending to do with this, with all the funky modifications, um, it looks to me like they never finished, uh, but whatever they were doing appears to have been ham related. An SST receiver is as good a guess as any. I got to thinking that before I spent a lot of time and effort trying to track down that interference, I should finish up work underneath the chassis. In particular, rebuilding the power supply down in this area. I've still been running this on the original caps and the uh, temporary diodes and rewiring job I had done. So, uh, using the uh, other chassis I had just done as a model. I'm going to rebuild this area. So where there had been a selenium rectifier mounted in here, I've got a terminal strip. And I'm going to mount three of the big caps in there. Another one will go in over here. And I'll put in some new wiring. And add a fuse, which is a topic I want to touch on a little bit. And, uh, Got some other goodies in this bag I'm going to talk about after that. So, here are some fuses I get just got. And you may notice something about them. They are white inside. Well, that's because these are slow, low fuses. I'll grab a glass fuse so you can see the difference. The reason they call them slow blow is they don't burn out immediately. One, there's too much current going through them. Here is a more conventional glass fuse. So all you've got in these, very easy to see, you've got a piece of wire. And they choose a wire size such that when it exceeds the current rating, it burns out. However, there's a little more to it than that. So say this is a 1 amp fuse. That doesn't mean when you reach 1.00001 amp, it blows out immediately. No. you got to look at the rating on these. It's something more like if it's at 2 amps, it'll burn out after 10 seconds. 3 amps, 5 seconds. 5 amps, maybe a tenth of a second. In other words, it's not an immediate burnout 
when it just slightly exceeds the current rating. Now, something else to keep in mind is that when you turn these sets on, especially when they're when they're stone cold, there's a surge current as the caps draw uh, charge up, and all the filaments when they're cold have a lower resistance. So you get a surge current going through two filaments, and that's where the slow blow comes in. So these don't burn out instantly. Well, neither do these, but these take even longer. The reason is they got a wire element inside of them too, but there's actually like a sand material around them that sucks up some of the heat. So when the wire in there starts warming up because there's too much current flowing through it, these act as a heat sink that makes the burnout take even longer. But still, not an exact uh, science on these. If you want something that does burn out very quickly, like something you'd use in a meter, pay more money. So something called HRC fuses, which is high rupture capacity. Another problem you can have with these is if you really got too much voltage and current across these, when the wire burns out it can arc over, flash over. You may have seen fuses that are really uh, blown out badly, they're all blackened inside and a mess. Well, HRC fuses are designed to blow and blow when they go I mean it's instant cut off dead and uh, it's also possible the glass on these can shatter on the HRC's There's their, they have a ceramic body they don't that's what you find in fuses like this military grade Fluke 27 alright so enough about fuses I will be adding one down in here something else in this bag of goodies are well, these are some high capacity rectifiers. I've been using 1N4007s in the past. These guys, rated 1000 volts 1 amp. Lately I've been going with these, 4508s. 1000 volt 3 amps. Not that the set draws 3 amps, just even more overhead. Why not? They don't cost much more. Ah, this bag. This bag has something I've never talked before talked about before, but uh, I knew about, in particular because of the pilot TVs, a little 3 inch CRT that's incredibly expensive to replace. But these are our TVS diode, transient voltage suppression diodes. And these are bipolar diodes. What these, you can think of these as, as being a back to back Zener diode. It's like a Zener diode in this direction, in this direction, in one package. What these do is they'll clamp voltage across whatever you put them across. In particular, if you put these across a tube filament, when you turn the set on, pretty well guaranteed that the voltage on that filament will not exceed whatever the breakdown voltage is of this guy. So, if you put these across the TR CRT filament, you're protected from overload. Remember, this is all wired in series. When this set is cold, Resistance on the tube filaments is low, and as they heat up, the resistance rises, but they don't all heat up evenly. So you may, for a brief time, get more voltage on one tube than another. These will prevent that from happening on the CRT in particular. So it would be interesting to put this on the CRT and then look at it with a scope. Is, uh, you got to choose the voltage on these carefully. If you go too low, then when everything's stabilized and running, you're going to be clipping the voltage on the CRT, and it's going to get less voltage than it should. If you use too high a voltage, or too high a value, it's not going to be offering protection. So I got ones that are rated for 9.1 volts. Now you may be thinking, hey, the CRT is 6.3 volts. Yeah, that's RMS peak-to-peak -peak voltage is more than that. Now uh, these don't come in any voltage you want. Uh, they come in uh, like I think 7.5, 8.5, 9.1, 10-point something. Anyways, I chose the voltage I thought was most appropriate. Uh, one thing you can do if you can't get the voltage you want is add something like a 1N4007 in series. In other words, a regular silicon rectifier because they have a breakdown or a forward dropping voltage of about 0.7 volts. So if you need to add 0.7 volts, 1.4 volts, 2.1 volts, 
start tacking on more of those. Or find a couple of these that are, if you add them together, will be the right voltage. At any rate, that will be something interesting to play with. I also got parts to build up some ballast. I'll try a couple techniques. One, I want to build some more diode ballast like the one I've been using in this. Because I got to give these sets to the owner, I got to give him ones with functioning ballast. So I crunched numbers and came up with the best resistors I could that have double the wattage I need at the right resistance. Um, but I also got some capacitors I want to try playing with. So, looks similar. 8 microfarad, 8.2 microfarad. These are for using capacitor droppers. However, it gets a little bit tricky. Most caps are rated in DC, like these are rated for 250 volts DC, but I want to have AC going across these. Most plastic film caps don't even have an AC rating. These do, and they're rated for 125 volts. And when this is operating, there's only going to be like 25 volts across these. The rest of it goes across the tube filament, so that's plenty fine. But what they don't give you is an AC current rating. So if I use two of these, one on each filament string, it'll be 0.3 volts, sorry, 0.3 amps of AC current going through them. I don't know how well these will hold up in the long run to that. Which is where these come in. These are... AC motor run caps. These are designed to have AC current running through them. They're made out of polypropylene, they're robust, but they're also big and they're overkill because they're rated for 250 volts AC, but this is the smallest I can find. They usually they come in big metal cans you may have seen like on a, an air conditioner or refrigerator. And I've also seen them come in this configuration which you may have seen me use in some radios and I will be continuing to use them in radios but again way too big to put a couple of these in this set unless you stick them underneath the chassis somewhere so just curious this is a uh, 6 microfarad 8 microfarad a lot smaller however these are rated for 470 volts AC uh, so again higher voltage rating, they use thicker plastic film, the caps get bigger and bigger. If I get one of these, an AC motor run cap, 8 microfarad, rated for like 100 volts AC, 125 volts AC, it'd probably be like half the size and that'd be fantastic, but I don't think they exist, so. We use what we can. Alright, so, uh, right now I want to finish doing the power supply. And any other work down here, I still got some resistors to check up through the IF strip, see if they're uh, off value. And then uh, play around with ballast and tracking down that, uh, that sparkly interference.